Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, dear students, uh, today we are going to start talking about uh, this class of drugs called anticholinergics, also known as mascarinic antagonists, also known as parasympatholytics. All of these are kind of uh, synonyms. Uh, so we will, uh, inshallah, we will talk about their classification, pharmacological actions, clinical uses, side effects, contraindications of these drugs. Okay, why I brought this uh, slide here? Maybe someone will say, oh, this does not belong here, doctor. This is direct acting cholinoreceptor stimulants. We are talking about blockers today. This is extremely important to remember these uh, effects of mascarinic receptor stimulation to predict and expect the effect of mascarinic receptor blocking or mascarinic receptor antagonism. Okay, so I'm not going to go over these things on the eye, you know what happens on the heart, on bronchial muscle, on the GIT, on the urinary bladder on the sweat gland all secretion increase so all of these we have uh, discussed in our previous lecture so please this is very important to review uh, before you start this uh, lecture okay uh, classification uh, parasympatholytic drugs anticholinergics or anti mascarinics okay uh, they are subclassified, they are classified first into anti nicotinics because cholinergic receptors include nicotinic receptors and muscarinic receptors, right? So now the drugs that act against uh, acetylcholine or compete with acetylcholine for these receptors, they are called anti nicotinics and anti muscarinics, okay? Uh, anti muscarinics examples include atropine, scopolamine, also known as hyoscine. Hyocyane, not hyocyamine. Okay, hyocyane is the same as scopolamine. Antinicotinics are further subclassified into, um, again, before I talk about this, nicotinic receptors are present in four locations, right? Uh, two of the most important locations are the uh, nicotinic uh, receptors in the ganglia, in the autonomic ganglia. And the second one is the, in the motor endocrine. The one in the autonomic ganglia called NN, right? So again, anti NN. This better known as ganglion blocker. They are in the ganglia. Examples include mecamylamine and trimetaphan. Uh, the drugs that inhibit the action of acetylcholine on neuromuscular in the blade or the motor in the blade in the uh, neuromuscular junction uh, is called neuromuscular blockers. These include tubocurarine and hexamethone. Uh, for the subclassification of anti muscarinics, they are either natural alkaloids, just coming naturally from Atropa belladonna leaves or from the Torah stramonium. Okay, they are, these include atropine and biocene. Again, this the same as scopolamine. Uh, the uh, second is semi synthetic derivatives, include homatropine and ipratropium. Uh, synthetic compounds include uh, anti-Parkinsonians like trihexafenidyl and benzotropine and midriatic drugs uh, such as atropine, of course, and cyclopentylate as well as tropicamide. The third subclass of synthetic compounds include anti-secretory and anti-spasmodic drugs which include uh, quaternary compounds. Again, I'm reminding you, quaternary means they are charged they are lipophobic. They don't pass blood-brain barrier, conjunctiva, or any lipid, lipid, lipid barrier, uh, such as propantylene and clidinium. And tertiary amines include oxybutynine and these M1. Remember in the table of the M1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 receptors of the muscaric subtype, uh, uh, we have this pyrenzepine and a new analog called the telenzepine, which is more potent. Both they have this suffix. I always like these things. It helps us to remember the, uh, the names of the drugs. Uh, uh, enzepine, okay, elenzepine, pyrenzepine. 
Okay, uh, let's start first with the prototype, of course, number one drug that has been discovered that deals with these uh, 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 muscarinic receptors as antagonists. Antagonist. It is atropine. It's obtained from uh, these two plants, Atropa belladonna datura stramonium. It binds, it's non selective, binds with all uh, muscarinic receptors, M1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. It's reversible inhibitor of acetylcholine, competes with acetylcholine for the M uh, receptors. Uh, uh, these uh, atropine itself is tertiary amine, hyacinous tertiary amine, and other tertiary amines are lipid soluble. Again, like what I said, they can cross the blood brain, blood -brain barrier and can have CNS effects. Also, they can cross the conjunctiva. Again, the, to cross the conjunctiva, the drugs need to be uh, lipophilic, right? So it has to be lipophilic to pass through the conjunctiva membranes, the lipid membrane. Uh, so uh, these drugs, the tertiary amines, can pass. Across, uh, across the uh, conjunctiva and reach inner structure of the eye. Uh, atropine usually is popular as eye drops. And other short-acting drugs such as cyclopentylate and tropicamide, which will be discussed later. Okay, the actions of these drugs. Okay, the muscarinic agonist, antagonist, the actions of these drugs include, number one, on the level of CNS. We have these, we mentioned, mentioned two uh, drugs, atropine and scopolamine. Again, scopolamine is hyoscine, okay? Uh, even though both are muscarinic antagonists, uh, atropine has stimulant action at this level of the CNS, but in high doses. Scopolamine, uh, in just therapeutic doses, can uh, CNS depressant can produce sedation. Uh, atropine in high dose can cause cortical excitation, hallucination, restlessness, delirium, Followed by respiratory depression and coma. Uh, they could, uh, these drugs could have effect on treatment of Parkinsonism because in Parkinsonism treatment we are we need to use uh, anti uh, number one dopaminergic drug drugs that increase dopamine uh, really, uh, production or uh, they, they themselves can stimulate the receptors receptor or uh, the second class is the anticholinergic. So these drugs can suppress tumors and rigidity of Parkinsonism, okay? Uh, scopolamine is effective in treatment of motion or exactly, exactly in prevention of motion sickness. You know, motion sickness results like someone is traveling uh, an airplane flight in like car, whatever. So there are uh, the cues around the uh, traveler is different. Is There is uh, like this disparity between all the senses received, the, the hearing, the vision, the sound, and everything. So this stimulates or uh, cause stimulation to the vestibular or cause a vestibular uh, excitation. And this will be uh, transversed, uh, uh, sorry, transported as an impulse uh, to the uh, vomiting center across or via parasympathetic neuron, which release acetylcholine. Okay, so it's involved in the stimulation and the vomiting. Uh, 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 precipitated by activation of this uh, vestibule in the ear and uh, consequent uh, subsequent uh, activation of the vomiting center. Uh, scopolamine is uh, will inhibit the binding of acetylcholine into the these muscarinic receptors and prevent this. In addition, they have, seen, they have said also that scopolamine itself can inhibit the vomiting center directly. So it's used as a uh, 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 just to prevent motion th sickness, maybe about uh, one or two hours before travel. Okay, on the level of the eye, again, again, again. Okay, so now the table in the beginning or the slide in the beginning that shows the effects on the eye. The effects of parasympathetic nervous system on the eye are this and this. Then we say muscarinic antagonists will have the opposite one. Parasympathetic nervous system activation on the level of the eye cause what? Cause meiosis, right? Activation of the constrictor pupillary muscle, okay, of the, I'm sorry, of the constrictor pupillary muscle, right? Uh, this is blocked by atropine, uh, constrictor pupillary muscle, the activation of it causes meiosis, right? Uh, the inhibition of this will, uh, will allow the sympathetic dilatory activity to prevail and cause midriasis, okay? On the level of this, the, 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 the circular, the, uh, the ciliary muscle, I'm sorry, the ciliary muscle, okay? The parasympathetic nervous system uh, activates the ciliary muscle and accommodates the eye for near vision, 
which is needed for the parasite during rest and digest. The opposite of that, again, is loss of accommodation to, for near vision, which is called cycloplegia. So now, I think, now we understand now things. Uh, the, I forgot to say the, 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 my, the midriasis caused the disease, but these, by these drugs could cause a photophobia and, you know, and abolition of uh, the light reflex. Because usually when there is a, a this intense light coming into your eye, there will be meiosis, right? Uh, so this kind of a reflex to the light, okay? And these patients, they have photophobia because they cannot have meiosis. They cannot narrow the eye pupil, so they will have photophobia. Uh, intra, yeah, the intraocular pressure will increase. You remember in glaucoma, I said it a couple of times that in treatment of glaucoma, you would like to have these two classes of drugs, either parasympathomimetics or sympatholytics. Okay. So this drug is parasympatholytic, it's the opposite. So it's contraindicated in glaucoma because again, in, in, uh, in, uh, in the level of the eye, parasympathetic nervous system, because it caused uh, the uh, activation of the constrictor papillae muscle, I said before, this will kind of displace or move, and so move the, the iris out of the way. So now the aqueous humor can pass through the canal of Schlem. Okay, easily, so the intraocular pressure will decrease, right? If you uh, need details of that, go back to our uh, lecture about muscarinic receptors and uh, drugs. Uh, so this will decrease intraocular pressure. This is the parasympathetic nervous system activation. What about if you if you do the opposite way, you will increase the intraocular pressure because you are not allowed the constrictor pupillary muscle to be activated, but not allow the iris to move and allow uh, to allow the passage of the aqueous humor. So now the intraocular pressure will be high and you are precipitating the patient to more aggravated forms of glaucoma. Uh, again, any secretion, we said all secretions are uh, enhanced or increased by the parasympathetic nervous system. If you, if you use the opposite way, the antagonist, this will decrease the lacrimal secretion, okay? On the level of cardiovascular system, again, we need to remember parasympathetic nervous system activation leads to bradycardia, right? Because they activate the uh, M2, they bind to the M2 receptors, which are GI, PCR. I'm reminding you of the previous lecture, okay? Uh, GI, PCR, which inhibit the uh, adenylate cyclase, which will, uh, so now we'll have less cyclic MP, less protein kinase, so this will decrease the heart rate. Atropine will, will inhibit the binding of acetylcholine into M2 receptors, so there is no bradycardia. So uh, uh, this will allow the uh, unopposed sympathetic activity to cause tachycardia. Uh, blood pressure, the vascular tone is usually uh, controlled by sympathetic nervous system, so these drugs have uh, no significant effect on the blood pressure. So this is M3, okay, glandular smooth muscle. The effect, again, of parasympathetic stimulation of these muscles will cause contraction of these muscles. Uh, therefore, the uh, atropine and the similar drugs will cause the relaxation of the smooth muscle, generally speaking. Okay, this will reduce motility uh, and also secretory function because the secretions, all secretions we said before, are increased by muscarinic receptor activation. Okay, and uh, we see the parasympathetic nervous system or muscarinic uh, receptor activation uh, cause what to the sphincter? Relax the sphincter. Now it will be the opposite by atrophy. Close the sphincter. Therefore, this will lead to can lead to constipation. But the good thing this could be could have antispasmodic effect. Pyrenzepine is better tolerated. We'll talk about that in uh, after a couple of slides. Uh, on the level of the urinary tract, again you need to remember the muscarinic effects on the ureter and ureter bladder. It causes contraction of these uh, of the walls of these organs. Then atropine will cause the relaxation, and this will cause urinary tension. Specifically in patients with prostatic hypertrophy, we'll explain this in, uh, after a couple of slides. On the level of the lung, what the muscarinic receptor stimulation causes, it causes bronchoconstriction and increased secretion. So atropine and similar drugs will cause the opposite way around, right? They will cause bronchodilatation and reduction of secretion, okay, from the nose, mouth, pharynx, bronchi. Okay, eplatrobium is better tolerated. We'll explain this later. 
Uh, the level of body temperature at atropine uh, can cause rise in a temperature okay, at higher doses due to two effects. Number one, because it will inhibit sweating. We said, right? We said parasympathetic nervous system cause uh, increase in sweating, right? This will inhibit sweating, the atropine. Number two, itself, it's, uh, it, 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 it stimulates the temperature center, regulatory center in the hypothalamus. So both will increase, cause hyperthermia. It's called sometimes atropine fever. The children are, are highly susceptible to this atropine fever because in the children, you know, they are very susceptible for the uh, fever, which can cause meningitis and many other deleterious effects. Uh, on the level of glands, again, parasympathetic nervous system stimulation called increase in all secretions. So the opposite of that uh, induced by atropine and similar drugs would cause decrease in sweating, sal salivary and bronchial lacrimal secretions due to the effect on M3. So now before we said M3, the previous slide was in the small muscle and here it is in the gland. That's why it was abbreviated next to M3 on the table. It's glandular smooth muscle okay uh, skin uh, therefore skin and rise become dry okay talk and swallowing will become difficult uh, yeah if you go from up down the effect of atropine and similar drugs will be a little bit less okay and uh, if you need to decrease uh, acid secretion from the stomach pepsin and mucus secretion need higher dose However, the effect on intestinal, pancreatic, and bile production of bile, uh, in the, in the gallbladder is not significantly affected by these drugs. This is now will be easy because we already explained the pharmacological actions. On the level of CNS, motion sickness already uh, explained. Uh, hyoscine, hyoscine, which is also called scopolamine, again and again, is the most effective. It's only prophylactic. You take it before the trip. Parkinsonism and the drug induced extra pyramidal symptoms, uh, we use benzotropine. Why don't we use atropine? If you remember, when I compared atropine with scopolamine, I said atropine, uh, to have central effect, you need somehow high doses. High doses will be associated with more, with more side effects, right? In addition, benzotropine is more lipophilic. Actually, benzotropine is the same as atropine, except uh, there is a benzyl group. Uh, uh, or exactly phenol group, benzene ring is added to the atropine. This benzene ring will uh, cause the molecule to be more lipophilic, more lipophilic. So it can pass the blood-brain barrier easily, so it could be used for Parkinsonism easily, okay, with less side effects. On the level of the eye, okay, Midriatics maybe, uh, yeah, I can use midriatics along with uh, my, myotics drugs to break adhesions between the iris and the lens. Uh, for diagnostic purposes, very common use. This is the most common use for in the level of the ophthalmology, uh, measurement of refractory error in uncooperative patients such as children uh, who require ciliary paralysis. Okay, in addition, the midriasis caused by these drugs will facilitate the examination of the retina. This is actually the most, most common use uh, most, most common ophthalmic use of these drugs. But I refuse atropine, atropine, look at the duration of action. Atropine action, you know, continues for about a week, also scopolamine. That's why they develop short-acting drug like homatropine, but the best or the most favorable two are the cyclopentolate and the tropicamide. You see the duration of action is just three, two hours, six hours. And tropicamide even is less than one hour. So you can, the patient can regain normal vision in a very short time as compared to atropine. The effect will last for days. On the level of cardiac, uh, cardiovascular system, uh, uh, yeah, atropine is used to counteract bradycardia and partial heart block induced by uh, drugs such as digitalis. Digitalis can cause bradycardia in some cases. So you can use it. Uh, use these uh, drugs to counteract the effect of the digitalis induced bradycardia. On the level of the GIT, you can use them for peptic ulcer because we said before they can decrease the secretion and decrease the motility. And this is, will be helpful for patients with uh, peptic ulcer. But do you use atropine? No. Uh, we have seen in the previous lecture about muscarinic receptor. And uh, drugs, uh, we said uh, atropine activates, uh, actually inhibits or antagonizes all the 5M receptors, 
in receptor M1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. However, pyrene zepine is selective M1 antagonist. Telin zepine is similar but more potent. So for in zepines, they are selective for M1. So they will have they can reduce the effect of uh, uh, decreasing the uh, secretion and uh, and uh, uh, decreasing motility with much much fewer side effects as compared to atropine. Okay, pyrene zepine even though it's tertiary amine but plus it passes blood brain barrier to a very small uh, small extent so it will ha not have uh, so much significant central effect this will add another advantage of pyrene zepine uh, versus atropine this is one of the most common uses of atropine itself is uh, uh, treatment of travelers diarrhea any condition hypermotility like irritable bowel syndrome intestinal colic any colic okay so uh, why? Uh, because atropine itself has anti-motility activity and also it's combined with opiate drugs such as diphenoxylate, which is also have uh, anti-motility activity. They both with each other will be like synergistic and it's an extremely very effective therapy uh, for uh, this trouble diarrhea and other conditions of hypermotility. The level of urinary tract, uh, to relieve you know, frequency, urgency, and enuresis in children. Okay, so now this is the good part of it. So for nocturnal enuresis in children and urgency, we need drugs uh, that stop or yeah stop the effect of acetylcholine on activating the urinary bladder and relaxing the uh, the uh, the sphincters. Right. So uh, these drugs include diphenazine, oxybutynin, and tolpyridine. They are selected for M3 receptor. Okay, M3 is glandular and smooth muscle, if you remember. Okay, darifenacin is the most selective one, followed by oxybutynin. Tolteridine is a little bit selective for M3. Okay, uh, CNF is that's why they are much, much more preferred as compared to atropine in this use. Uh, CNF effects are less likely with darifenacin, of course, it's more selective for M3. So minimal effects on the level of the MCD, M1 receptors in the CNS. Okay, on the level of the respiratory tract uh, to treatment of uh, chronic uh, obstructive pulmonary disease or asthma, uh, we use uh, ipratropium. Uh, please, these suffixes are very important for uh, tiotropium. Okay, these are inhalational drugs. Number one. Uh, so why don't we use atropine? Yes, you can use atropine, but these drugs are quaternary ammonium compounds. Both drugs are quaternary ammonium, okay, tropium, tropium, quaternary ammonium compounds. So they are, they have a charge, so they don't have central effects. Okay, so, uh, but they are less effective in most asthmatic, asthmatic patients. In these patients, uh, for specifically for bronchial asthma, uh, uh, number one drugs are, as you know, they are beta-2 agonists such as salbutamol, terbutaline, and uh, uh, other similar drugs. In anesthesia, in pre-anesthetic medication, you can use them for, uh, usually used for pre-anesthetic medication to block responses uh, to vagal reflex used by surgical manipulation of visceral oral organs. So when the, there is a surgery is going on, there is a manipulation of, of visceral organs which can increase the uh, secretion and somehow the motility also. So this could be decreased by pre by the uh, atropine and similar drugs. Uh, in addition, uh, new stigmine and are used uh, to cause uh, muscle relaxation. Okay, but the, their effect could their effect could be could continue for uh, some time. So to reverse this effect, you need to stop the new stigmine. New stigmine again is choline sterase inhibitor that will allow the buildup of acetylcholine at the muscarinic receptor, uh, generally muscarinic and nectarinic receptor, so atropine will block the effect of neustigmine uh, on the, uh, at the end, on the level of the muscarinic receptor. They are antidote for cholinergic agonists. Okay, uh, cholinergic agonists here, we mean that these choline stress inhibitors, whether they are organophosphates, uh, physostigmine, mushroom poisoning, all of these have choline stress inhibitory activity. You can use atropine and similar drugs to treat this uh, toxicity by these drugs. Now for the contraindications and adverse effects, easy, very easy. You know now these drugs themselves, they can cause urinary tract obstruction. So as you are, uh, they are contraindicated in patients with urinary tract uh, obstruction, 
or uh, GIT constru construction because they can cause constipation, right? Uh, in glaucoma, of course, because they raise the uh, intraocular pressure, as we explained before, so they are contraindicated in glaucoma. In patients with benign prostatic hyperplasia, okay, patients with benign prostatic uh, hyperplasia themselves, they have urinary retention. And these drugs in themselves, they cause urinary retention. You understand now? That's why they are contraindicated in patients with PBH or uh, benign prosthetic hyperplasia. And in constipation, because they, they, these drugs themselves, they can cause constipation. Uh, they uh, cause dry mouth with difficulty in swallowing and talking, uh, decrease the sweating, with reasses, with photophobia, getting near vision. We already explained this before. Uh, decreased lacrimation and precipitation of glaucoma, explained before. Okay, all of these are expected from knowing the very first slide we talked about it in the beginning that you know the effect of muscarinic receptor stimulation, then you can talk about the opposite by using these drugs. Tachycardia, because these drugs can cause bradycardia, the muscarinic receptor stimulation can cause bradycardia, these drugs cause tachycardia, decreased respiratory secretions. And some central uh, side effects uh, include cognitive impairment, excitement, delirium, hallucinations. Uh, as we explained before, children are very susceptible to the hypothermic effect of uh, atropine and it's highly dangerous in these uh, patients, uh, in the children specifically, it's in high dose. Finally, uh, how to deal with atropa belladonna or uh, atropine or the terastromonium uh, poisoning? Okay, how to deal with this? Uh, uh, again, uh, we'll deal with, the, with it later, but how the poisoning occurs, it occurs just overdose, or uh, people sometimes use, consume these seeds or berries of these peladonia and the Torah plant just to relieve spasm or uh, some sedation, whatever. Uh, so if you, if you do that, uh, 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 children, generally speaking, are highly susceptible, okay, and generally the manifestations are due to exaggerated uh, many, uh, pharmacological actions because you are uh, uh, use, uh, you are uh, in the children, the, 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 the overdose uh, will have more effects as compared to the uh, adults. Treatment of atropine or belladilla poisoning. Number four here, or the, the fourth one, we already talked about it. We said physicistamine antagonists, both central and, and peripheral effects of uh, of atropine. Uh, the other thing you do, gastric labas with tannic acid to take the drug out of the IT. Uh, the patient should be kept in in a dark and quiet room. Dark where the patient has uh, photophobia, right? A quiet room because of the central system, uh, central nervous system manifestations. Uh, because the patient have hyperthermia, you apply cold sponges, ice bags, apply to reduce body temperature. That's it for now. Thank you, and I hope you have enjoyed uh, this uh, lecture. And uh, enjoy, and please say, Subhanallah, uh, Alhamdulillah, uh, Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah. See you later. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.